Uh, I recently finished reading a book, um, an audio book, on the history of the kings and queens of England. Um, and it was a very interesting book in a lot of ways. I'd not really uh, read a whole history of the kings and queens and how the monarchy came to be and all of that. So there was a lot there, a lot of fascinating stuff. But one of the things that kept coming up over and over again, particularly in the Middle Ages, was how often people just died at a young age. And this is not just kings and queens. I mean, they were included in this as well. Leadership, it didn't matter really what status you were in society. You did not live all of that long, most of the time. Most people, about half of people, didn't even make it to age 10. But if you did, you could just as well keel over at 22 from some random infection that there were no antibiotics to treat. Or if you were unlucky enough to live in the 1300s, the Black Death probably got you. You could have gotten run over by a horse, or the Viking invaders came in and took care of you. I mean, the list goes on and on. There were all of these different ways that people suffered, that people died. And as I was reading through this, this wasn't the main point of the book, but it just kept coming up over and over again. And it's a good reminder that for most of human history, life has been short, and it has been quite hard and quite difficult. And we really don't expect that most of the time now. We don't realize that suffering is a part of human, the human experience. And suffering is part of the reason that we're studying this book of Lamentations. I mean, it's a part of what we experience, and we need to understand this, which is why God has graciously given us this book, to help us to understand suffering, how it fits, and then to learn how to respond to it, what to do with it. You can't ignore it, and you can't avoid suffering. Now, I told you last week, if you were here, that all suffering ultimately comes into the world because of sin. Genesis chapter 3 is when sin enters into the world, and when sin comes into the world through Adam and Eve's decision there and passes down to all of us, it bends and twists creation, God's good creation, and now you and I reap the results of that into our lives. Things don't work as they should. There is corruption in the world. There's sickness. There's death. There's disease. There's suffering as a part of it. Now, I told you last week, and I want to make sure this is clear, that you can't always draw a straight line from some experience of suffering that you have in your life to some particular sin you've committed. You did this, therefore you get sick. It doesn't work that way. And even if it did, you and I do not have the ability to draw a straight line from this sin to this suffering. There are all sorts of reasons for suffering. Suffering comes to us because of sickness and disease, from natural disasters, from decisions that political leaders make. I mean, in that book on the kings and queens, that was very clear. They decide something in their very narcissistic way, and a ton of people suffered because of it. Suffering often comes to us from outside of us, not based on necessarily anything we've done. And so you have to keep that category in mind, even as you read Lamentations. Now... Having said that, and tried to make that as clear as possible for you, the book of Lamentations does draw a straight line from Israel's sin to their suffering. There are people in this book, and we'll read about some of them this morning, who are innocent. It's not that they're free from sin, but they're innocent, and in, in that, their sin did not cause this suffering. The children that Dom read about just a few moments ago are examples of this. But in this chapter, you're going to see, and it's the background of this book, that there is a straight line here between Israel's sin and Jerusalem's destruction and their suffering. Both categories are mentioned in this chapter, and chapter 2 is going to help us to respond to both categories, suffering that is not a straight line from sin, and then suffering and difficulty that does come into our lives because of our own poor decisions and our own sinfulness. That is something that happens. And so this chapter is going to give us guidance on how to respond to sin and how to deal with sin. That's what we'll see here today. So, Here's what we're going to look at in Lamentations chapter 2. Three responses 
to the struggle. It's a little bit more on this, but sometimes I can't fit it all and I don't want to make the font too small. So three responses to the struggle brought by sin and suffering. Three responses to the struggle brought by sin and suffering. And the first one of these is to recognize the Lord's just anger over sin. This is in verses 1 through 10. So I'm going to try to break this chapter down for you and make it as clear as possible how it progresses because it it does have some organization to it, a nice progression to it. Verses 1 to 10, recognize the Lord's just anger over sin. So I told you last week that in chapter 1 of Lamentations, there are two distinct voices that we hear. You remember this? In verses 1 through 11 of chapter 10, there's the poet. And most people think that poet who's from the outside describing what has happened to Jerusalem is the prophet Jeremiah. And then in verses 12 through 22 in chapter 1, you get the city woman or the city of Jerusalem. She is personified and speaks out of her own experience. In chapter 2, we find those same two voices. But in chapter 1, they got equal time, and in chapter 2, they don't get equal time at all. Verses 1 through 19 in chapter 2 are all the poet. They're all Jeremiah speaking, and then you only get the city woman's response, Jerusalem's response, in verses 20 through 22. So all of it builds up to the last few verses of the chapter. The first 10 verses, though, with our first point here, are Jeremiah, or the poet, articulating the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, I'm not going to read over this whole section again. Dom read it this morning. But over and over again, I think you probably picked this up, and if you didn't, that's okay. I'm going to draw your attention to it. Over and over again in these first 10 verses, the poet says that this destruction has been brought about by God. God is the one who has done this. In verses 1 through 8, there are 28 verbs that deal with and describe destruction. 28 verbs that describe destruction, and the subject of every one of those verbs is God. He's trying to make it abundantly clear to us that God caused this. Now, the Babylonians may have been the ones holding the swords, and they may have been the ones that tore down the wall, but ultimately, in his sovereignty, God is the one who has brought all of this about. Just look at verses 1 through 3 again to get a sample of this. How the Lord, in his anger, has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. He has cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. He has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. The Lord has swallowed up without mercy all the habitations of Jacob. In his wrath, he has broken down the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought down to the ground in dishonor the kingdom and its rulers. He has cut down, you see the rhythm here, in his fierce anger, all the might of Israel. He has withdrawn from them his right hand in the face of the enemy. He has burned like a flaming fire in Jacob, consuming all around. Notice in verse 1 here that God casts down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, from start to the end of verse 10, describe this lowering and casting down. This is sort of a theme for what you're going to read in these verses. In fact, if you look over at verse 10, you start in verse 1 with Israel in heaven, exalted in splendor, and then what do you find in verse 10? The elders of the daughter of Zion sit on the ground in silence. They have thrown dust on their heads and put on sackcloth. The young women of Jerusalem have bowed their heads to the ground. They started in splendor and glory, and because of what God has brought about, they are sitting on the ground, and some are even bowed down with their heads in the dust. Lowest of low points here. This casting down includes every aspect of the city. The people of the city are cast down. But it's not just the people. It's the structure of the city. It's the institutions of the city. Look at verses 6 and 7. Here he's describing the temple itself as having been torn down and cast down. 
He laid waste his booth like a garden, laid in ruins his meeting place. The temple was the meeting place where God meets with human beings, where he meets with his people. In fact, in verse 1, the footstool is another way to describe the temple. And the idea of the footstool is that God is sitting in heaven, but is resting his feet on earth. And it's the connection point between heaven and earth. And so the footstool is the temple where God meets with people and comes to earth and connects there. And in verses 6 and 7, he has even destroyed that. The Lord has made Zion, verse 6 again, forget festival and Sabbath, and in his fierce indignation has spurned king and priest. The Lord has scorned his altar, disowned his sanctuary. You can see he's destroyed the temple and the meeting place that he had with Israel. But it doesn't just stop there. It goes out to the walls of the city itself. Look at verse 8. The Lord determined to lay in ruins the wall of the daughter of Zion. Verse 9, her gates have sunk into the ground. It's complete and total lowering of the city. Humiliating of the city. Destruction of the city. And what has brought it all about? It's God, but specifically... What about God has caused this? If you go back to verses 1 through 3, multiple times in these verses, it says that it's all because of God's anger. He's angry. Now, what has made God this angry? That he's done all of this lowering and destruction and humiliation to Jerusalem. Notice verse 2 again. It says here, the Lord has swallowed up without mercy. As he destroys and brings to ruin, it says that he's doing all of this without mercy. Now, wait a minute, you might think. We just sang about God's mercy a couple of times this morning. And the Old Testament consistently describes God as the God of mercy and compassion. I mean, listen to Exodus 34, where God reveals himself to Moses. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. God is full of mercy, and he still is. And this is not saying he is put that attribute aside and is no longer a God of mercy. But you'll notice here in Exodus 34 that it says he's slow to anger. Not that he's without anger. Not that he never reaches a point of anger over sin. And verse 7 says that God will by no means clear the guilty. He's not a God who just bypasses and ignores sin and sort of winks and nods at it and says everything will be all right. That's not how he operates. Back in verse 1 where it says the beginning, the Lord in his anger. It's very interesting in Hebrew, the word for anger is the word nose. And in the Old Testament, the nose is the body part that is associated with anger. Flare your nostrils when you're mad, right? And so God is slow to anger. It takes him a long time to reach the point of anger. He doesn't fly off the handle. God doesn't have a temper. He's not out of control. But his nose does eventually fill up. And he breathes out in judgment as a response to sin. This is true of God. This is accurate to who he is. So his anger has brought this about, but what specifically has caused his anger to the point where he's brought this destruction on the city of Jerusalem? So walk back in your Bible timeline And if you don't have a Bible timeline in your head, that's okay. Let me explain to you what has happened to get us to this point. This is the year 587 B.C., hundreds of years before this. God had rescued his people out of Egypt. 
They were in slavery in Egypt, and God had rescued them out of that, and he had brought them to Sinai and made a covenant with his people and told them he would bless them and they would be his special people, and he'd given them laws to obey at Sinai. Well, then as they journeyed through the wilderness, they reached the edge of the land that he had promised to give them, the land of Canaan. And they're at the edge of that land, and they're waiting to go into the land, and the book of Deuteronomy comes as a second giving of the law. It's to a new generation of Israelites. And in the book of Deuteronomy, God gives this generation of people and all those who would come after them and would live in the land clear instructions on how to live according to his covenant in the land. He tells them what to do. He tells them how to live. They need to obey the covenant that he's given to them. That's their responsibility in the land of Canaan. Now, with these instructions, near the end of the book, you get a chapter of the promises of blessing to Israel. If they will obey, God says, I will continue to bless you because you're my special people. But he also says, because you're my special people, if you disobey then there will come a point where I will bring curses on you and judgment on you. That chapter is Deuteronomy chapter 28. Listen to a couple of the verses here in Deuteronomy 28. I'll read them to you. He's saying this to Israel. If you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commandments that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you if you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Pretty straightforward for them, right? Verses 15 and 16. But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city and cursed shall you be in the field. And you can go read this. There's a lot of curses and a lot of blessings that are potential for them. Verses 45 to 50. All these curses shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you till you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes that he commanded you. They shall be a sign and a wonder against you and your offspring forever, because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart, because of the abundance of all things. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies, whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst, in nakedness and lacking everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. And then listen to this. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the end of the earth, swooping down like an eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand, a hard-faced nation who shall not respect the old or show mercy to the young. All the way back when they entered the promised land in the book of Deuteronomy, God promised this. And they enter into the promised land and they struggled to keep God's covenant. They pursued other gods. They disobeyed God. They worshiped idols. They worshiped other gods. They lived like the pagans around them. And what does God do? He's patient. He's patient with them. He waits in kindness and mercy. He brings some judgment to try to bring them back and they sort of return He sends prophets like Jeremiah to tell them and remind them of the covenant and remind them that they need to obey and they need to turn from their sin and turn to him in repentance. But over and over again, they don't turn to him. And still, he waits in patience and kindness. And the whole book of Jeremiah is basically filled with Jeremiah telling them, this is your last shot at it. Here's what's going to happen. Turn from your sin and trust in God and his word. But finally, God's anger reached its limit. And his just judgment had to fall on the people. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 36, we get a summary explanation of why God has done this and what's happened. 
the Lord God, the God of their fathers, sent persistently to them by his messengers because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. But they kept mocking the messengers of God, despising his words and scoffing at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord rose against his people until there was no remedy. Therefore, he brought up against them the king of the Chaldeans, Nebuchadnezzar, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary and had no compassion on young man or virgin, old man or aged. He gave them all into his hand. That description in 2 Chronicles, all the history of Israel has has led up to the book of Lamentations. And Lamentations 2 is what is, that's what's being described here. It's this destruction. Now, As we see all of that play itself out here, there's something that you and I need to understand that maybe is a little uncomfortable to talk about. The God of the Old Testament is the same God that we read about in the New Testament. Now, he's the God who came in the person of Jesus Christ to take on the judgment for our sin and to absorb the wrath of God that was meant for us and to rescue us from judgment and sin. It's the same God. And He's done this work for us so that we don't have to suffer under His judgment and wrath. But this chapter of Lamentations makes it abundantly clear for the Israelites and for us as well that God's patience and kindness and his waiting and his offering and us continuing in sin reach a limit. There's a limit to this. Israel could have turned by doing what? Not doing a bunch of good works by responding to God's word in faith, by repenting of their sins and turning to him, trusting in his promises and believing in his word. It's the same thing for us now, but they didn't do it. And we have the same offer, Hebrews chapter 10. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God and has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified and has outraged the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In the same way, God's judgment over sin will be felt by those who reject his son and continue in their sin. The Bible makes this abundantly clear. If you reject Christ, if you hear the offer of grace that comes because of the work of Christ and fail to turn from your sin and trust in him, you will suffer the eternal judgment of God. That's how this works. It's not a pretty thing to think about, but it's true and it's real and it's biblical. So, Back to Lamentations 2, these first 10 verses. They're kind of shocking. The Lord in his anger has done this work. They're the poet's description of the judgment of God on Israel for their sin. But it takes an interesting turn here as you get to verse 11. He's described their sin and the anger of God and the judgment that has come in verses 1 through 10 that they could have averted if they would have repented and turned to God. But having witnessed this, the poet who is watching this whole thing, probably the prophet Jeremiah, he sees their suffering, he sees the consequences of their sin, and he responds personally in verses 11 through 17. And it's kind of amazing to watch his response. And I think it's instructive for you and I as we see people who are suffering and maybe even as we see those who are suffering for their own sins as they continue without repentance and faith. 
And I think this should inform our response as well. So three responses. Recognize the Lord's just anger over sin here. But the second one is to reach out with sympathy. This is what Jeremiah models for us. He cannot remain unaffected by what he sees. Look at verses 11 and 12. My eyes are spent with weeping. My stomach churns. My bile is poured out to the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people, because infants and babies faint in the streets of the city. They cry to their mothers, where is bread and wine? As they faint like a wounded man in the streets of the city, as their life is poured out on their mother's bosom. This is a brutal scene. I don't know if you picked up what's happening here the first time that Dom read this this morning. But this is probably Jeremiah, and he's probably describing what happened as he walked through the streets of Jerusalem during the siege when Babylon had the city surrounded and no one and no food could come in and out. He probably saw this very scene play itself out on the streets of the city, and it's horrific. Mothers who are weak with hunger, lying on the street with their children, also who are weak from hunger, and their children are begging their moms to give them food as they lie on them without any energy, and the mother has nothing to give to them. No wonder Jeremiah feels like he does in verse 11 and why he describes his response this way. But I want you to notice verse 13 here. What can I say for you? To what compare you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What can I liken to you that I may comfort you, O virgin daughter of Zion? For your ruin is vast as the sea. Who can heal you? He asks this question at the end of verse 13 because he's sympathetic with their their plight, with what's happening. He's horrified by the suffering that is being experienced by God's people here. And so he wants to bring comfort and he wants someone to be able to heal them. And so he asks this question in verse 13. And then in verses 14 through 16, he goes through some options. Who could bring healing to them? Look at verse 14. Not their prophets. Your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. They have not exposed your iniquity to restore your fortunes. This is amazing. What's the problem with the prophets? They didn't tell the people about their sin and the judgment that was coming. They acted like everything was fine. But have seen for you oracles, verse 14, that are false and and misleading. They didn't speak the truth. They're no help. They can offer no healing because they don't see the situation as it is. Verse 15, here's another option. All who pass along the way clap their hands at you. Who is this? This is people who live nearby, neighbors that are passing by and see them in their destruction. What do they do? They offer no help. They hiss and wag their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem. Is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty, the joy of all the earth? No help there. Verse 16, maybe their enemies will see the plight that they've brought about and show mercy to them. Verse 16, all your enemies rail against you. They hiss, they gnash their teeth, they cry, we have swallowed her. Ah, this is the day we long for. Now we have it, we see it. No healing, no mercy is able to help them. None of these people can bring it. And they can't heal and can't offer comfort or help because of the summary that the prophet, the poet, gives us in verse 17. Look here. The Lord has done what he purposed. He has carried out his word, which he commanded long ago, back in Deuteronomy. He has thrown down without pity. He has made the enemy rejoice over you and exalted the might of your foes. Now, I told you that Jeremiah responds in sympathy here. And I want you to think about this for a second because I I think this is helpful for us for how we approach those suffering and how we approach those who continue in their sin. Okay? Think about his situation here, Jeremiah. Consider his role as a prophet. What has he spent his time doing? He wrote a whole book about it. It's one of the longest in the Bible. He has spent his time calling these very people to repentance. Repentance over and over again. And he suffered because he called them to repentance. And over and over again, they refused him. They would not listen to him. And we just read in this book that he acknowledges that they are suffering because of God's just and right judgment 
over their sin. And now, even after offering them repentance and calling out them to repent, them refusing, and them suffering just judgment because of their refusal, even in that situation, Jeremiah responds with sympathy to them. Verse 13, I think, is a beautiful description, an example of how to respond to someone who's suffering in sympathy. Seeking to comfort, seeking to ask questions, seeking to help. But despite being ignored by the people, despite them shunning God's word, despite that God's judgment is just, Jeremiah doesn't come in here and say, I told you so. You're getting what you deserved. I told you so. He sees the destruction that sin causes and he weeps because of it. He knows that sin brings this about and he weeps because of what he sees. He sympathizes with them in their suffering. He acknowledges the pain. And at the end of the day, not in an I told you so sort of way, but what does he want? He wants them to turn from their sin because he knows where this ends up. He wants them to repent and seek the Lord and turn to the Lord. He's asked this question in verse 13, who can heal you? And there are no good options yet. And the Lord has brought this about in his sovereign and just judgment. But the question still stands, who can heal you? And now Jeremiah gives them the answer to that question in verses 18 and 19. And then the city will respond in verses 20 to 22. Run toward God. Here's the answer. This is what they need to do. And this is the beginning of the response that leads to healing for Jerusalem. Now, it's a fits and starts. It's not super clear. It's not all at once. It's a struggle. But this is the beginning. The prophet calling them to turn to the Lord. Look at verses 18 and 19. Their heart cried to the Lord, O wall of the daughter of Zion, let tears stream down like a torrent day and night. Give yourself no rest, your eyes no respite. Arise, cry out in the night at the beginning of the night watches. Pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint for hunger at the head of every street. These are the poet's words in verses 18 and 19, and they're filled with commands, aren't they? To the middle of verse 18, it starts, let tears stream down like a torrent day and night. Give yourself no rest. Verse 19, arise. Why does he say arise? Because of what we saw in verse 10. They're bowed down in rejection and humiliation by what they've suffered. And so he says, listen, give yourself no rest. Arise, cry out in the night. Look at the middle of verse 19. Pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. This, this is a beautiful description of both lament when you're suffering and it's a beautiful description of repentance. Pour out your heart before the Lord like water. Whether the suffering you are experiencing is due to sin or not, this is where you start. It all starts here. Pouring out your heart before the Lord. God in his sovereignty has allowed whatever you're going through into your life. So lament the pain. Recognize the pain. Acknowledge the pain. Describe it to the Lord. Describe your difficulty and then turn to God. He's the sovereign. This is the tension in the book that we've talked about. He's the sovereign king. He's the one who has allowed this and brought it into your life. Run to him because he's the only one that can, find, can bring healing and the only one that can bring comfort. And that's what Jerusalem starts to do in verses 20 through 22. Look there. Look, O Lord, and see with whom have you dealt thus. Should women eat the fruit of their womb, the children of their tender care? Should priest and prophet be killed in the sanctuary of the Lord? In the dust of the streets lie the young and the old. My young women and my young men have fallen by the sword. You've killed them in the day of your anger, slaughtering without pity. You summoned as if to a festival day my terrors on every side. 
On the day of the anger of the Lord, no one escaped or survived those whom I held and raised my enemy destroyed. Now, this is not a full, clear example of repentance. But what is going on here? Well, the city starts to use some of the same descriptions of what she has suffered as Jeremiah has used. She acknowledges that this is due to the anger of the Lord over sin. And I think what's happening here is Jerusalem starting to have her perspective shaped by God. And yet, she's still struggling, mightily struggling, mightily asking questions. Why is this happening? I can't believe this is going on. And that really is the point of the book in a lot of ways. Lament. And the point of the book is, if you're struggling, don't struggle on your own. Take your heart to God. Lay your questions, your protests, your concerns before him. And that is the beginning of the pathway to healing. Now, that's Lamentations chapter 2. And I want to pivot here and make it clear that I'm pivoting as we finish up this morning. I want to talk about this, this idea of the heart running toward God. All right? We've talked about this happening, running toward God, if you're suffering, and it's not necessarily due to sin. But I want to talk about the heart running toward God when it comes to our sin. And I want to talk about this specifically, maybe for believers who have fallen into sin, but I want to talk specifically about those who are maybe hearing the gospel for the first time and who have yet to experience the new birth. And I want to apply this idea of running to God to the experience of the new birth. So let me explain what I'm talking about here, okay? The Bible teaches that we are born spiritually dead in our sins. You and I come into this world dead in our sins, and someone who is dead does not have the ability to respond to God, to love God, to choose God. And that spiritual deadness, that inability to come to God, that rebellion against God and separation from him puts us under the wrath of God, like Israel was here. That spiritual deadness puts us under the sentence of God's judgment. You are born into this world under that sentence. And if you die physically under God's judgment, then that results in eternal judgment from God. That's a pretty rough situation to be born into. But because God loves his creation... He has made a way for us to be rescued from his wrath and judgment. Jesus Christ came to earth and lived without sin, which is something none of us can say for ourselves. He lived without sin and yet suffered God's wrath and judgment and penalty for sin on the cross. And he did this as our substitute, taking our place. He took what we deserved, which was judgment for our sin, and he offers us what we don't deserve and what we could never have on our own, which is his perfect righteousness. The fact that he never sinned. He offers that status to us. And when you are clothed in his righteousness, covered in his righteousness, when you have that applied to you, your sins are forgiven. They're wiped away. You're You're not responsible for them anymore. There's no guilt and no shame for those sins anymore. And when that happens, the the wall, the separation between you and God has been completely taken care of and you are free from his judgment and wrath. Now, the only way to access that righteousness, which is what we need and what we don't have on our own, is to have your sins forgiven because Jesus died for them. Having your sins forgiven, receiving that righteousness of Christ, that happens in a moment of time, and it happens at the new birth. Now, here's what all of this has been leading up to and the question I want to ask about the new birth. How 
do you experience this new birth? It sounds kind of abstract and out there. How do you experience this new birth? Or we could say, how are you born into God's family as a new creature? You're dead in your sins, but how do you receive spiritual life? So it's tempting for us to think that there's There's got to be something I can do to make this happen. There's got to be some way. So maybe God wants his people to be holy, so maybe I've got to get my life in order. And then the new birth will happen. Maybe I've got to start living right, or maybe I've got to stop doing these things in order for the new birth to happen. And then maybe God will grant me this status of forgiveness of sins and the new birth. It's tempting for us to think that. Or maybe it's tempting for us to think, well, it's a church. And so if I just come to church consistently, or if I take communion consistently, do what the church tells me to, then maybe God will accept us, accept me. The answer to that question, how do you experience the new birth, is not to do your best. It's not to make sure you're a good person. It's not to turn your life around. The answer is not even to be a decent person and have your good things outweigh your bad things. None of us are decent people. We're born spiritually dead. We've all sinned and we come short of the standard of God's perfect righteousness. Only Jesus meets that standard. So what do we do? We see all this. And the new birth is there, and maybe you're not sure you've experienced it or not. So how do I experience the new birth? How do I receive forgiveness of sins? And how am I saved from God's judgment over my sin? The Spirit of God works through God's Word. So this is part of the reason that we teach and explain God's Word. Because as the gospel goes forward, as you explain and hear the gospel proclaimed, which has just happened this morning, as the gospel is proclaimed, the Spirit works in you and brings about two responses in your heart. And these two responses are two sides of the same coin, and they happen at the same time. What are these two responses? I'm going to use two words to describe them. They go together. Repentance and faith. These are the two responses that happen in you when you experience the new birth, okay? Repentance is turning from sin. So you're going this direction, dead in your sins, pursuing a life of sin. Repentance is recognizing that and turning from your sin, That's one side of this. I see my sin. I see it for what it is. I see the end result of my judgment under God's hand. And I know I'm toast if I keep going this way. I've I've not done enough to earn God's favor and I never could. And God's judgment and wrath are resting upon me and I deserve it. And repentance says I don't want my sin anymore. I see it, and I don't want it anymore. I don't want to be controlled by it. I don't want to be dominated by it. And so I turn from it, and I turn to, and this is the other side, and this is faith. I turn to Christ in faith. The cry of faith is the acknowledgement that I cannot earn God's favor because of my sin. Because I'm a sinner, the core of who I am. And so I turn from sin and turn to Christ, and I know there's nothing I can do about my sin. Only Christ can take care of it. And so faith is the belief, it's the resting in, it's the trusting in Christ's work on the cross, that he has paid for my sin on the cross. And I know he's paid for my sin because he rose victorious over sin and death on the third day. And so it's this trust and this resting and this belief that his sacrifice is for me because God promised if anyone calls on the name of the Lord, they will be saved. And so I need this and I want this and it has to be applied to me. And God, I'm throwing myself on your mercy and on your word because you've promised this to me. 
And it's a heart of faith that says, I'm grateful, I'm thankful for this. I love what Christ has done, and I delight that he loves me and offers this to me. That's repentance and faith. Now, I know I've gone long this morning, but I felt like this was really important that we needed to get this across here for you. So I'm going to end by reading Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, and we'll stop here. Therefore, since we have been justified or declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since, therefore, we have now been justified, declared righteous by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life, his righteousness. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Let's pray.